Good morning, Rock. How are you guys? Stand up and give a shout out to Jesus. This is all about Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for what you're going to do this morning, God. I feel like the Lord has surprises for you. Who in here has autoimmune dysfunction? Raise your hand. All right. You see these people with their hands up? I've had enough of autoimmune dysfunction. I, I can't stand it. If you have COVID responses that aren't going away, is that you? Okay. Stand up. I want you to look around. You're the body of Christ. You're the healing power of Jesus. Put your hands on these people. We're going to pray for them right now. If you are online and you are one of these people with autoimmune dysfunction or you're having COVID responses uh, that are not going away, put your hand on your own head. Agape team, I know you're out there. Rock prayer team, put your hands on these people. Father, in the name of Jesus, we declare your authority. We declare the blood of Jesus over these people. And we see every system of the body, every autoimmune response to come into partnership with heaven right now and to be healed by the blood of Jesus. Father, we speak life where there has been a spirit of infirmity in a family line. We cut it off by the power of Jesus and we say no more lupus, no more thyroid conditions, no more endocrine malfunction. In the name of Jesus, we speak life to even irritable bowel syndrome and all these other things that are autoimmune related. MS, we cancel the assignment through the generations on illness in your endocrine system. So Father, we speak life and every symptom that has been caused by the spike protein of COVID. We curse those symptoms and we command you to leave these bodies now in the name of Jesus. We speak life. We speak healing. We speak the healing love of, Father, of the Father over every system and every cell. Light them up, Jesus. Light them up. We speak healing, and I bless you with the shalom of God from the top of your head through the entire system of your body. Respiratory systems come to life right now. Cardiovascular systems, every bit of your body right now under the authority of Christ. And I speak healing and blessing in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Look, there is no shortage of authority. There's no shortage of the power, the resurrection power of Jesus. There's only our lack of willingness to engage. Yes, I said that. Listen, I've just come back uh, from, uh, we just, gosh, we've just been all over the place. So much to say, so little time. Okay. <laughs> Father, thank you uh, that you're here. Thank you for this house. Thank you that this will always be my home church, no matter where we live. And thank you, God, that uh, you are moving mountains across this earth through simple people who just say yes. I, I'll go. I'll go to my cubicle next door in my business, and I'll just be love. Father, I pray right now that whatever has offended us, whatever has hurt us, whatever has come against us, whatever is limiting us, Father, we just lay it down and go, that's it. I'm done. You're the God of justice. You're the God of truth, and I'm going to believe you. All right? Are you offended? Live in America. Be offended. That's, that's, that's the spirit. That's the spirit. It's alive and well. It's causing division in families like I've never experienced in my life. Listen, my husband uh, is right here. You've never sat on the front row. I love you. If you're online, I love you too. Um, my husband and I, uh, on a word from the Lord, listen, if you're called to stay, you need to stay and you need to grow roots deeply and you need to stretch out your tent stakes because people are coming in. Our life is not our own. We're not living in our little houses and shutting the garage. That's a California mentality. I love the Honies. They've always had Halloween shindigs in their driveways. I used to hear about them. I'd be like, what are those people doing over there? And I realized I was that person who shut the lights off. My husband and I were like, we're not home. Put on a movie and act like we're not here. <laughs> Please be the love of Jesus in a hurting and dark world. People need you to stretch out your hospitality, your generosity. I have no idea what I'm going to talk about anymore because my mind is going a million places. Listen, people, if we don't look different than the world, how are they going to find themselves in the hands of Jesus? Stop being offended. So on a word from the Lord, he told me almost three years ago, you're going to move to Franklin, Tennessee. I said, I don't even know where that is. I Googled it. I'm like, wow, that's a cute place. 
And then my husband and I went there. And then standing on Main Street, he said, I like it here. I go, I like it here too. But I never told him we were moving there. <laughs> I just pray. And then he goes, he doesn't remember saying this. He'll tell you he didn't say it, but he said it. I could live here. I was like, let me get my recorder out on my cell phone. <laughs> because I knew he didn't really mean that. That was like the spirit saying to me. Because he's born and bred Californian. Loves it here. Well, we moved to Franklin, Tennessee. Because that's what God said to do. I'm not saying to you, move to Franklin. I'm not telling you to move anywhere. I'm telling you, those who are called to move need to move right now when the Lord says it. Those who are called to stay need to stay. Grow roots. Stretch out your tent pegs. Because this is what the Lord spoke to me. About five months ago, I woke up in the middle of the night and I was like, that's kind of weird. I saw a giant chessboard. I saw the Lord's hand. He was moving the pieces like really fast. I said, what are you doing? He goes, those who are called to stay need to stay and stretch out. And I saw squares on the board stretch out. Okay, if this is unfamiliar to you, I am sorry. It's the prophetic of God. It's symbolism. Okay? Listen. So, he stretched, so, so squares are being stretched out, but then other people are being moved all over. And he said, those who are called to stay need to stay, grow roots, stretch out. Those who are called to move need to move right now. And I said, why? What are you doing? All of a sudden, the game stops. And I see, checkmate. He goes, because if people will do what I say in this season, then the enemy will remain in checkmate until I come. Ooh. Do you understand? The game's already been won. Your life's already been paid for. There's victory in your life. Why don't we live like that, everybody? I, I feel like this morning, I want to tell you how much fear and assumptions and fatigue distort truth. Isn't it true? You just, you just get so run down with this political thing. You're like, I'm done. And yes, I am going to talk about it up here. Sorry. I'm not political. When my son and I got into it, I was like, oh, man, that thing came in my front door. So I had to pray my son into another place. I was like, Lord, just move him so that he can experience what he had was really good. Do you know sometimes the Lord allows desolation and desert experiences so that you'll realize what you had was good? The Lord desires to bless you. And he's blessing my son right now in Oregon. Because my son, our son, has experienced some things in Portland that made his eyes go. I'm like, hmm. well, if you can't learn it in Rockland. I'm a mom who knows how to let go. I'm all my spiritual kids. I'm like, get out. Come on. Go. Do what you're called to do. And I do that with my son. I love my son extravagantly. But I know what he's called to do. And if he can't do it under me and my husband, he's got to learn to do it under the Lord. And sometimes that requires a desert. So we moved to Franklin, Tennessee. It's just an obedient thing. I have no idea. I mean, I know what the Lord wants to do, but I don't know how it's done. And do you know that if you try to make something happen, that's called manipulation. So as you get tired of this political thing and you get tired of your freedoms getting robbed from you and you get tired of all this stuff, you stop fighting. That's what the enemy wants you to do. Don't you dare. And you don't fight with your mouth. You fight on your knees. The power of prayer and the power of generosity is what changes the shape of your business, your family, your neighborhood, your community, your church, and this state and this nation. So I just want to tell you about a time. I like to tell you about all my mistakes and stuff. <laughs> Makes me feel better, you know, because it's daily, just so you know. So uh, we have been in all kinds of places this summer, crazy places. I was in the middle of the mud hole in Kentucky having revival meetings, crazy stuff. I actually did an a, did a online service before this, and, and uh, I talked about that there, so you can, you can listen to that later. But, uh, and then we went to, uh, I, I flew to Germany, and then I was smuggled across the border. Yes, I was smuggled across the border. I just won't say where, but I was smuggled across the border 11 hours later to be in a region that wasn't letting anyone in because of covid but there wasn't any COVID there, so it doesn't make any sense, right, when you think about it. But the Lord said to me, the gospel will go to the ends of the earth. Are you going? I was like, if you're going, I'm going. So we went. We did that for a week, and uh, lots of chaos broke out in the camp. And, uh, and all of a sudden, let me just tell you how much it's important for you to be listening to what the Lord's saying that's new. In the middle of the chaos of the camp, I was like, nobody saw that coming. That's really weird. And in walks a whole bunch of people from another country. 
And they've, they're marching in like they're the army. And I'm like, oh my gosh, the, the army's here. Like, who are these people? They were intercessors in another country that heard the word of the Lord to come to this. I'm not kidding. Come to this place. And if I could tell you where it was, you'd be like, that's got to be God. Like, it is not a close place. They show up and they march around the place where we are for two days and declare the glory of God in the place. And then they come in and some random old couple, older than me even, they come in and this woman is like the fire of the Lord coming out of her mouth. And, and everybody, she's like, we're like, who are you? She goes, the Lord sent me. I'm like, well, I believe that because look at these people. Who are they? And these people don't know each other. They're from one country. They're, they're from, I'm like standing there going, huh? And the Lord goes, in the day before my coming, my people will be my volunteers. Psalm 103, verse 7. Do you understand the Lord is saying, you're going to go where I want you to go? I think those intercessors that came in charging with heaven's army, they had no idea what they were coming into. They just came because the Lord said. And then in the end, we got a chance to pray for them and they all ended up on the floor, which was so, so thrilling to me that those who come to serve will be served. Can you remember that next time the Lord asks you to do something hard? He wants to bless your life. Okay, so then from there, I flew to Egypt and we were ministering to the persecuted church. And I wanna tell you, I was really tired. I was so tired. Kentucky and then the, the thing in Germany and then the other country and then on to on Egypt and there was no sleeping and I was just exhausted. And really my, my whole outlook was, was really compromised in that time because that's what fatigue does. And I can't tell you that I had fear because I really don't run in fear, but in the moment, I, we had a bucket list thing to do. We actually had a half a day off and I wanted to go to the Great Pyramids and ride a camel. Is that on your bucket list? Just slay yourself right now. Don't, you don't need to ride a camel. Just want you to know they stink, they have bad breath, they fart a lot and they make these horrible noises and they have flies. Like it's the worst. And I was like, oh God, whose bucket list was this? And they all look, the team looks at me. One of them had the bucket list too. So she was sort of with me. And I said, oh gosh, I hope this ride is only like four minutes because this is the worst. And this is before I even got on the thing. You know, I was just like smelling them from a distance. And so I don't know, did those pictures ever get loaded, Randy? They did? Okay. I just want to tell you what happens when, when truth is distorted. I want to tell you how fast this happens, like zero to 60 in about, you know, a nanosecond. So, so this is me finally on this camel. Okay. Uh, that's Jessica. I want you to see that, that, do you see that that camel has eyes there? Do you see that? Okay. But, but yeah. And this is the, the joke of everyone afterwards. They circle the eyes and keep sending me pictures. I've gotten camel books in the mail, but that, they will never let me live this down. Okay. And I think there's a video uh, I don't know the if that loaded. Okay, th so this is the journey, right? And I was really praying to the Lord that that would not be me having to go all the way to the Great Pyramids from where I stood uh, because I just wanted to ride the thing for like one minute, seriously. Okay, so that's the Great Pyramids. And, uh, and then I think there's one more picture uh, where I tried to show you what I'm about to tell you. Okay, I, I realized <laughs> that this means nothing to you, but just humor me for a second. Uh, from the top of a camel, when you're looking down, there are these big holes in the head right here. You can look it up. And they just have skin, but they look like eye holes. Okay, go with me here. They don't have any eyeballs in them though. Okay? All right, here I am on day whatever I was, 21 in ministry. I'm so stinking tired. These things smell like, I, and I have a very high, like I can smell anything, ask my husband. When I walk in there, I'm like, oh. <laughs> I, hey, women, right? Supersonic smelling. I, I like have spidey senses in my smeller. And so the smell was like killing me. I'm tired. And all of a sudden I say these things come out of my mouth. I go, oh my God, this camel is blind. <laughs> this, I, oh my God. And I go, Jessica, Jessica, immediately, immediately I have no comprehension of reality. Jessica, my camel's blind. <laughs> and I go, and then it just, I just add. See, this is what you call the ladder of inference if you're studying sociology. This is where you add your own meaning. You can't figure out a meaning, so you add your own stuff. Welcome to the United States of America. That's what's happening right now. Okay, you can't figure out the truth, you just add one and put it together and then we just call it good. That's what I did. 
I go, oh my God, the holes. You see the holes? That's where the eyes go. Okay, if you're on a camel, look, the eyes are way down here. I can't see those eyes. And I completely forgot that I'd seen them when I got on the creature. <laughs> it's like, what is the matter with me? I'm completely lost my mind. And I'm looking, I'm freaking out. And I go, I look at Jessica, Jessica goes, what? She goes, is mine blind? I go, yes. <laughs> okay, Jessica, she's like, you know, Laura Croft, Tomb Raider, that's Jessica Tate. If you don't know her, look her up. She has lived in the Congo. She slays the giants for Jesus. I mean, she is just like, take no prisoners. She's my spiritual daughter. She's 33. Okay, I am twice her age, and I'm going, they're blind! They've gouged out their eyes, and now Jessica goes, Joe, you have ruined this entire trip. I just want to get off now. If they have blinded these camels so that they will be obedient, I, that's it. And I go, that's it. And then she, <laughs> it just gets worse. And then, then the little guy who's the shepherd, whatever they call those, nomadic person with the outfit comes and hooks our camels together. I go, well, there it is. <laughs> Our blind camels are the ones that will be led because they have no eyes. We, we are on camels who are going to cause the death of us because they can't see anything. And these are the rebellious camels. I'm just adding more stuff. Do you ever do that? You just add stuff. It's crap. It doesn't mean anything. And she's like, I'm so unhappy right now. And then the other two, two women on the trip, no Amy, who's, who's originally from Poland. She goes, what are you guys going on about? And, and Jessica goes, our camels are blind. Our camels are blind. And Amy goes, what? And she's so confused. She's just looking at us. And, and then Lucy is trying to get on her camel. She's the last one. And then Jessica turns all the way around in her saddle, which you're not supposed to do. And she goes, ah, Lucy's eyes has camel. I mean, she goes, Lucy's camel has eyes. I go, well, that's because Lucy's camel is the lead camel. <laughs> I mean, doesn't even phase me. I'm still on my, our camel's eyes have been gouged out. <laughs> if you camp on a lie, you'll miss the revelation. Yeah. I'm just saying, okay, because I'm about to teach on truth. This is like such a meaningful, <laughs> she goes, if you don't put this in a book, I'm putting it in a book. Because this was one of your worst, I go, I get it. I, I was at my <laughs> all time worst. Because she says, Lucy's camel has eyes, and I say that's the lead camel. And sure enough, the nomad goes and puts Lucy's camel in the front. So though it looks like truth, it's not really truth. And then puts our camels in the middle, and Noemi's camel, and then he leads Noemi's camel around, and, and, and she goes, Noemi's camel has eyes too. I go, that's because she's the rear camel. <laughs> this goes on for 25 minutes. Lucy and Noemi have good camels. We have bad camels. And this ride's going to be awful because our camels don't have eyes. And in the end, Noemi goes, there's something wrong with you, Joe Moody. She goes, lean yourself around. I go, I'll probably fall off. I mean, they're not comfortable. She goes, lean yourself around. I lean all the way around and I go, oh my gosh, the camel, its eyes are on the side of its head. <laughs> Oh, God. And then Jessica almost falls out of the saddle, laughing hysterically. So for the rest of the time while we're ministering to the persecuted church, I'm listening to blind camels the entire trip. Do you understand? We've all done that. We've all done that with stuff. You just go, blah, blah, blah. And then you add all this other stuff to it so that it makes sense to you in the crazy moment that you're living. Well, we're living in a crazy moment. I want you to turn. That was a long intro, God, I don't know. <laughs> turn to Psalm 51.6, would you? Lord, we just pray for your word this morning. And uh, you know I'm always late, God, but I uh, endeavor not to be late. Uh, let me say while you're, while you're looking for that, <clears throat> um, Brandon, while I was praying for the church, I just wanna tell you what I saw, everybody so that you can be praying into this. So um, I just asked the Lord for a word for the rock, and I, and I saw the church, uh, and, and I've, I've been partner to this church for a very long time, and I love this place. This is my family. And, but I, I saw something that was unique. 
<clears throat> and I believe that it speaks to the season that we're in. I saw the church as a red rose, and it was a single red rose, and it was really, really fragrant, but it was only half open. So listen, I felt like, uh, and this is just me, so you pray and you ask the Lord, and if it doesn't make sense to you, or you think that's, you know, you know, that's like blind camels, then throw it out. <clears throat> But I felt like each petal represented specific aspects of ministry assignments that God has given to the rock and to those who are called to steward those assignments that call this place family. The petals are slowly opening, but at just the right speed. So where you feel like you're in delay, I feel like the Lord is saying, do you trust me for the timing? Um, so as this flower, which is the whole collective fragrance of God here at the rock, opens, there's going to be a noticeable increase in unity. There's not going to be backbiting because we, we have a lot of that going on. It's not just in the churches, everybody. It's everywhere because it's a spirit. <clears throat> um, okay, so, uh, and then this was the other thing that I was, I was really, uh, really kind of blown away by. When, when a healthy rose is not all the way open, it's hard to pull the petals off. So though you want it to be all the way open, the petals are easy to fall off. I felt like for this season, it's a tight cluster because it's harder to pick one of you off. Does that make sense? And then a lot of you know about, you know, the crushing of a rose petal, it gives more fragrance. A lot of you have been crushed and pulverized, but you are not struck down. Okay, and that's how you ended up at the rock. So this, it's harder to have the petals plucked. And then um, this is really important because each petal that is left adds to the volume of the flower and the fragrance. And every part of this flower, every petal adds to the beauty and the overall fragrance that comes out. So you're very important here. This church, if this is your first time, I welcome you here. If you call someplace else home, God bless you in that home. But make it a home where you're investing. You're not just coming to get. It's really, really important, everybody, because uh, our pastors and our leaders are under tremendous amounts of duress in this season. The political climate they have to steward on a regular basis is unfathomable to you. To run a church and to try to navigate this slimy, slippery slope is very hard for them. And so I want you to pray for your pastors and pray for your leaders. I know they look cheery when they come here, but I know the burden of their heart. I steward that too with our team. As things come down the pike from governments and, and institutions and we're told this and you can't do that and, and this is, you know, be silent there. It becomes more difficult to navigate and nobody uh, that I know in this house is political. We're informed. We're not religious. We're children of God who are set apart for glory's sake. We're set here as lighthouses. Amen. So be that. Good. But that is from love, not from your opinion. So the next time you try to talk about blind camels, you may just lead somebody right off a cliff like I almost did. Wow. <clears throat> it's pretty good to just hold your tongue sometimes. I had my siblings with me in uh, Tennessee last weekend, and one of my siblings is a um, very different uh, view of life. And once it started, I just sat there and I was just quiet. I, I'm not going to do that anymore. You can say whatever you want to say. And I bless you. And then I pray for an opportunity to speak truth. So I had to wait 24 hours. <laughs> I know you think that's hard for me because it is. But I did. And then and the 24 hours later, there was an opportunity. It was like a red carpet. Boom, boom. You want to say that? I'll, then say it in love. And I did. And at the end, that sibling of mine was like, man, I never thought of it that way. I didn't go, <laughs> told you so. I just said, well, you know, I'm not trying to like influence you at all. I'm just stating where I'm coming from. That's all. And we, we had this meeting of hearts because the timing was right. Yes. Wait on the Lord, everybody, and then speak out of love, not just so you're right. Yes. Okay, Psalm 51, 6, 10 minutes later. Behold, you <laughs> desire truth in my innermost being and in the hidden part of my heart, you will make known to me wisdom. Say, make known to me wisdom. Gunther was praying for wisdom and, and he's praying for discernment. We need that. In the passion iteration of that same verse, it says, I know you delight to set your truth deep in my spirit. So come into the hidden places of my heart and teach me wisdom. It's really interesting in this passage of scripture, the psalmist believed to be David is inspired by the Holy Spirit to connect truth with wisdom. 
I submit to you, you can't have one without the other, right? That would be illogical. How can you have complete truth without wisdom and revelation? David is said to have written Psalm 51 to the Lord after he sinned with Bathsheba. Don't you know he was in desperate need of truth and wisdom after that? So wisdom is the illumination of the Holy Spirit that allows us to have discernment to clearly identify what the truth is. Did you get that? Wisdom is the illumination of the Holy Spirit that allows us to have discernment to clearly identify what the truth is. The only truth that you and I need to be focused on in this season is the truth according to the standards of the Word of God and the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Period. Not the politics, not the medical reports, not the whatever you're listening to. The standard definition of truth used to be that which is in accordance with fact or reality. That's what it used to be. It used to be, another common way it was described, was fidelity to a set standard. Okay, keep those in mind. So you might be really interested to know that a new meaning of truth has creeped onto most websites. Dictionary.com and many others. And if you look it up today, you might see those other two, sort of a amalgamation of those two, but what you're going to see is this, a fact or belief accepted as true. Hey, I'm not joking. Look it up. It's scary. What is generally accepted as true? Okay, I can see your brains on fire because mine was like, what? How did that get in there? Where's the fidelity to a set standard? What happened? What do you think's happening? Exactly. It's an entire corruption of what we know to be the truth of God. Are you surprised? Read the Bible. Read the Bible. So what is accepted as truth today under this new definition, at least in America, is what everybody just believes is true. There is not a set standard anymore, but simply a belief that something is true suddenly makes it true. If I believe it, it's true. Period. Don't argue with me. That's my truth. That's my thing. That, you know, hey, I'll cancel you. Now, that believing something is true is true. We have a whole new level of deception happening in America. Even if you're not consciously aware, you have personal values. It's the standard you live by. You know, if you've never done any of those kinds of assessments, it's, it's really eye-opening. So you live by a set of standards, even if they're subconscious to you, and you will believe on them and you will behave according to those beliefs. In other words, the personal values of your life frame your worldview. Okay? And express that worldview, we're creating a truth. If our worldview is distorted and altered, we're going to live that truth and we're going to fight like crazy, even if there's facts to disprove us. We're going to go, nah, I'm living my truth. We're seeing it all over the media. We've been seeing it through the whole election, see it through the whole COVID thing. You know, I wish <laughs> I had a dime for every person who has said to me, Man, I just wish I knew who to believe. Have you said that? Can't believe anybody. Because you are not seeing the truth the way God sees it. He says, though deep darkness covers the earth, let your light shine. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God is what? Risen upon you. This is your time, everybody. You know, I don't think you arbitrarily just came at this time. I believe you were invited by the Lord to come at this time and live as a representative, as an ambassador, as a lighthouse of hope and to introduce a very dark world to the only light there is. Throughout the New Testament, we see Jesus as the person of truth. Turn to John 15, 26 and 27. You guys Okay. Okay, bless you guys online. Jesus said, I send to you the divine encourager from the very presence of my Father. He will come to you, the Spirit of truth. Who are we talking about? Holy Spirit, right? Emanating from the Father, and he will speak to you about me. And you will tell everyone the truth about me because you have walked with me from the start. So he's talking to his disciples about the Holy Spirit who will be given to him, but the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. 
The Holy Spirit is the compass for total, factual, and evidential truth, fidelity according to the standard that God set. So you can't live as a Christian without the Holy Spirit and have revelation. You will be going on yesterday's bread. Day old bread is horrible. Stale and it's dry. And it'll choke you. Religiousness, choke you. So the Lord says, in John 15, 27, the word, the word says that we will tell everyone the truth. It's also stated, you will provide evidence of Jesus. Does your life provide evidence of Jesus? And I was on a treadmill in the middle of somewhere. I don't even remember. I think I was in Oklahoma about six weeks ago. And I'm running on this treadmill. And all of a sudden, I go, you know, Lord, I haven't really been doing anything like in places like this. Like, I mean, I know I'm all over the place with traveling and stuff. But like in a hotel, in the gym. Like if there's somebody around here that needs something, like I haven't done that for a while. I've just gotten used to putting my blinders on and going, this time is for me, right? Have you done that lately? Happens to the best of us. I'm like, and I'm not praying for that person that has a limp right there, I'm busy. Because I just prayed for 2,700 people and I'm tired. Okay, I get it, rest is, is necessary. Right, but, but I just kind of got out of the habit you know, of being available. So I'm running and the Lord goes, there's a housekeeper in there. And I'm looking at a pool complex that's, you know, through the glass. And I see this, this housekeeper and she's trying to sweep and she's limping. I go, okay, I'll go there. So Jess goes with me. I go, hey, I'm going to go pray for that housekeeper. She goes, oh, I'm in, jumps off. And so we went and she doesn't speak one word of English. Jessica speaks Portuguese. That was not helpful. I had five years of Spanish, and I can say yo habla espanol, but that's not true because I can't really speak it. So, <laughs> you know how that goes in school. You just write it all out, and then you can't speak. And so that was me like, uh, no, no habla anything. So we're trying to have this, this whole dialogue, and it's not going well. And the Lord goes, just be quiet. Just pray for her. And so through, and then Jessica goes, oh, Google Translate. So she does do that. And then the woman... I don't know what's wrong with her. I just know she's limping. And she pulls up her pants leg and she's got a scar like all the way around her ankle. Like her ankle was almost dismembered from her body. You can see that. And uh, so I was prayed the most simplistic thing, prayed four times. And when we were done, this is how kind God is. God, I haven't done that in a while. You know, if you have anybody, oh, by the way, there is somebody right there. Do you know that's how fast he'll answer your prayer? Fourth time. She looks at us, she goes, no, like it's done. And she gets up and the whole time I didn't realize there was another housekeeper watching this entire engagement on a broom like this. <laughs> you will show evidence that Jesus is real. That, though, that housekeeper was like this, Woo! after her friend got healed. And the friend walked out of the pool thing, just, you know, and I was like, Okay, Lord, I'm going to go back and work out. We go back, we work out. The next day, I see that housekeeper in the lobby, and she looks at me, and she goes like this. <laughs> because he's good. And the whole time, we're going, Jesus, Jesus, yeah, we're saying, and she's like this. You know, I knew she was Catholic. But the point of it is, are you going to be that light? You know, I didn't pray anything special. I just prayed in his name. And his name is what healed her ankle. John 16, 1, I've told you this so you will not surrender to confusion or doubt. Never in my lifetime or your lifetime do I think we have a more urgent, necessary moment to engage. I don't know what some people are waiting for. I'm not more qualified than you to go to Egypt and speak to the persecuted church. I'm sitting in the persecuted church going, why am I here? The Lord goes, because you said yes. I think we don't understand the person that is sitting next to you at your job or the person that you are online with all day if you're working at home. These people are in the dark. They don't need you to preach at them. They need you to be love and release wisdom and revelation to them. 
I could go into such depth here, and I want to, but I know that I don't have time. Look at John 17, 17. So you have a place to go when you're really struggling. Look at John 17, 17 with me. Jesus is praying to the Father for his disciples, and he's praying this for us. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I've sent them into the world. Listen, everybody, unless our truth is the word of God, you'll be eaten alive out there and you'll be calling people blind camels. It happens so fast. This deception when you're in fear, when you're tired, when you're overwrought, when you're worried, then you just start adding all kinds of stuff and it's not truth. What is the truth that Jesus said? We are sanctified by the truth of the word of God. How do you grow up in him? His word sanctifies you through and through so that this inner fire comes to life. There's no other way. If you've gotten out of the habit of being in the Bible, please get back in it. That's the deep dive right now. There's revelation that's coming to all of those called by his name through the word and the presence. The word and the presence. All right, listen, I want to go to one more place and then I'm going to wrap it up because I know that somebody's going to jump up here and go, wrap it up. Okay, <clears throat> turn to John uh, 18, real quick, real quick. I'm going to paraphrase. Okay, this whole passage of scripture, Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. I'm going to talk fast, so listen fast, okay? Okay. His friends fall asleep even after he asks them to stay awake and pray. Meanwhile, we got Judas. Dun, 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 dun. Sam, that would have been a great moment for you. <laughs> gun, 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 gun. Okay, <laughs> sorry, didn't give you a warning. <laughs> Judas has already met with the religious leaders and the temple guards and accepted the 30 pieces of silver, which you may not know, that was the common amount paid for a male slave in that day. They have bribed Judas to be the one who identifies Jesus to the temple guard, so they'll arrest him. Judas, incidentally, has a truth that does not line up with the truth of Jesus as Messiah. Jesus has said his kingdom has come upon them, but his kingdom is what? Not of this world. That's what he said. Judas wants Jesus to overthrow the Roman government and be a worldly king. He missed the real truth. Because he was so busy wanting what he wanted, his mind was closed to revelation. It's happening, everybody. It's happening to us. I've seen it over and over, the demands and the dialogue, the demands and the dialogue of this world, constantly. What is vying for your affection in this time? I have missed the new revelation of the truth if I am listening to what people are saying around me. I've got to go back to the word of God. The last thing, Pilate. I love Pilate because Pilate is this guy that is so arrogant and he comes in with the king of kings and he turns and says, John 18, you can read it, verse 33. He, he doesn't really even fathom who Jesus is. He's got this guy who is causing all these problems in front of him. He's annoyed. And when he faces Jesus, he says, you're the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, are you saying this on your own? Or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Can't you just hear him? Whatever. If he was in California, whatever, dude. I'm not a Jew. Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of the world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants will be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, Pilate said to him, so you're a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I'm a king. For this purpose, I've been born. And for this, I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? 
Jesus was speaking the truth of God as Pilate asked him questions. And Jesus spoke the truth of God's plan and God's kingdom. And that is supposed to happen through us. His life was lived as a testimony of the truth that we get to live today. And what Jesus said to Pilate ultimately didn't matter to Pilate because Pilate had his own belief system and that was what he accepted as truth. Open your eyes. It's the same spirit. It's all around us. Pilate, his question, what is truth is profound. Just as in that moment today, truth is subjective to those interpreting it when power, control, and manipulation rule. And those who think they have control and those who set out to manipulate you, don't be fooled. Jesus. Pilate's worldview was framed by his experiences and his power and the level of corruption in that day. We've got some of those same politicians. Why don't we stop complaining about them and pray for them? on the firm foundation of the truth. I implore you to get in the word of God and study Jesus as the person of truth. It is essential for not only your survival and mine, but for us to rise above offense, rise above manipulation, rise above this political agenda that's being shoved down our throats, rise above the loss of freedom to travel and to do what America is known for, to be able to make your own choice. Let's pray. Stand up, please. (laughs) Father, world influenced by beliefs that become truth without fact prevail. The only way people will know the truth is through knowing you. Jesus, you said you are the way, the truth, and the life and only you have the power to transform hearts and transform minds so father we call upon you and we ask that heaven come down on the president of this united states i ask that your spirit fall on the cabinet that he listens to that those that are in power in the senate and in congress governors of states everyone in leadership and in power in this government Father, that they would have an encounter with your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, that would so cause them to fall on their knees, God. That they will come face to face with you and they will see that they have been duped. That that ears, there is no power. There is no lasting power that is outside of you. So, Father, we lift our voices to you this morning. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you come crashing in to secret boardrooms, to the border, to all of those who are making decisions, God, for evil and not for good. And I pray, just as you showed me at the beginning of COVID, that you would expose the corruption in the seven mountains of influence that create culture. And as you expose we would not wag our fingers and say, we told you so. We would stand there as people ready to embrace the broken, the corrupted, the lost, the manipulated, and we would be the love of God. So Lord, I thank you this morning. It's not by power, not by might, but by your spirit that we are transformed. So I don't know where you've fallen into a slippery slope of truth that really isn't truth, where you've believed things that don't have fact, like I believe camels are blind. Could happen to anyone, especially when you're tired, especially when you've been sick, 
especially when your family's one way and you're trying to stand for Jesus, right? Right now, close your eyes and I just want you to pray. Just say, Holy Spirit, I invite you to invade me. Any place that I have believed lies, any place where I've been manipulated, I ask you to reveal those places to me. Jesus, where I've been offended or hurt by people around me, where I've been misunderstood, I forgive all those people. I'm not here to please them. (laughs) I'm here to please you. So today, I ask for your wisdom. I ask for your revelation. I ask that you, Lord Jesus, the King of truth, become my stable footing. Become the bedrock and the cornerstone of my whole life. Today's the day, Lord. I'm done with politics. I'm a kingdom ambassador. Use me to change my family, my workplace, my church, my community, the state of California, the United States, and the world. If you want to move me, God, move me. If you want me to stay, Give me the boldness and the courage to live generously, to let you root me deeper and stretch out everything I have so others can come in. Lord, I partner with you in all of heaven. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done right here through me just like it is in heaven. For the glory of Jesus' name.